Welcome to the Heal Your Hunger Show, where we get to the heart of why you overeat and how to stop. If you struggle with food and weight like I did, welcome home. Welcome everybody to the Heal Your Hunger Show. So happy to have you here. It is a great day to be alive and I'm super happy about my guest today, which you're going to love. Um, and I just want to say if you're here at the Heal Your Hunger Show for the first time, welcome. So glad you're here. This is a great place to be. If you're tired of dieting, if you're tired of the weight loss struggle and you have just this inkling that it might be a deeper issue and that food's not the problem. So um, that's really, uh, that's the land where I live, having been 50 pounds overweight and knowing that diets didn't work, you know, and really needing to find a better way. And what worked for me many moons ago was to deal with emotional eating and get to the bottom of why I was so compelled to eat and to eat the ooey gooey chewy foods that I knew weren't good for me. I had enough knowledge under my belt to know what was healthy and what wasn't, but I could couldn't follow through with what I knew. So if that sounds like your experience, welcome. I'm so glad you're here at the show. And please join us over at the Secret Sauce group. If you haven't joined us on Facebook, um, go to Secret Sauce, type in Secret Sauce to end emotional eating. And that's where we uh, do a lot of um, amazing uh, recordings and classes and all that kind of thing. So I'm um, really happy to have you here. So we are recording this live in the Secret Sauce group. And I have an amazing guest here today. So um, if you are here live watching, please put some comments in the comment section. We'd love to hear from you. If you have questions and I can catch it, um, I can even ask the question live here with Eric on the, uh, on the recording with me. So yay. So welcome, Eric. So glad to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. It's so good to be here. Yes. And you, you're an amazing man. You've done many really cool things in your life. Um, you know, I mean, being a producer and, you know, a, a worldwide speaker and just so many, so many amazing things. You've got a very long bio. So I'm going to, I'm going to actually <laughs> just say that you're the founder of Wild Fit. Um, that's a big thing, what we're going to talk about today, just because we have that in common, our, our beautiful passion for helping people eat healthier and be healthier all the way around body, mind, and spirit. So I'm just really excited to be here. I was excited to be on your show and it's really wonderful to, ha to have you on my show. So welcome. Thank you. Yeah. So talk to me. I know you had struggles with your health early on and that kind of uh, really preempted your desire and passion to help people with their health. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you know, I, I, when I was young, I was that kid, you know, always had Kleenex, always had the allergies, always had that scratchy throat thing, you know, like I always had that and I was a little pudgy and nobody would have called me fat. Nobody would have, no, I wasn't that, you know, we, we had the overweight or, I mean, I hate it, you know, in the seventies, we called them fat kids, right? It was like, yeah, that was me, by the way. <laughs> there you go. And you know, what's funny now is that overweight um, children are so common that now it's the skinny kids. Right. It's, it's switched so, true. so heavily. But, you know, back then I, I, um, I knew that I wasn't well, but I didn't think much of it because it had been my condition the entire time. It was mostly my parents that were worried about me and sending me to see doctors and all that stuff. And um, by the time I got to 21, I had taken so many drugs and so many injections. And I even got to the point where one doctor wanted to take my tonsils out and so on. And that's where one day some very good friends of mine sat me down, you know, uh, really you know, had a talk with me about food and, 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 and rethinking my relationship with it. And, you know, I got to say, Trisha, I wasn't unhealthy by, by most standards and most people aren't by most standards, you know, sure. I ate a little fast food here or there. I ate the, I had, you know, I, I drank some soft drink, I, but I, everybody does that. And um, man, 30 days later, 35 pounds gone, uh, all the allergies gone. My, the, the entire, my, my face changed shape so much that I flew to South Africa to go visit my mother and I brought my girlfriend with me. And my mom looked at me in the arrivals lounge and didn't see me, like looked right at me and didn't wow. see me. Wow. But my girlfriend's uh, got very distinctive red hair. She saw her <laughs> and then looked back at me again. And then the recognition dawned. And I had, you know, my, my body and my face and everything had changed so much. My sleep had changed, everything about my life changed. And that for me stimulated a, uh, a really powerful curiosity about how it was possible that I could spend five, six, seven, ten 10 years talking to doctors and specialists and not one of them, not once, not for five minutes, asked me what I ate or recommended that I did or didn't eat something, not one of them. And that's all it took to fix it all. And that kind of made me mad, but it mostly made me curious. 
Absolutely. So what are the, what were the culprits of, of the allergies and uh, really just the weight gain, would you say? You know, I mean, ju- um, junk in I, general, but it was it like dairy or, you know, yeah, I mean, I think it was what? general it, to a degree. I think, you know, it's funny, like, um, I'm generally not a fan of dairy products, but I think some people can kind of get away with them. But then if you combine it with this and this and this and this and this, then, then it kind of all boils over. So for me, the ones that were very obvious were dairy products, I, you know, Acne and dairy products, direct, it's not correlation, it's cause. It's, it, that is, it's absolutely clear to me. In fact, Trisha, I, I went at one point, you can imagine what it's like, 14, 15, 16 years old, desperately want to talk to girls, face covered in acne. I mean, it was awful. And, and I remember, you know, went to go see the specialist and he's got, I've got a drug for you. It's going to work. And it's like $3 a pill and you have to take one a day. That's an expensive pill every day, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the drug was called Accutane. And I, I looked on the, on the, you know, warning of the Accutane. I don't know. I was a weird kid reading the warning. What kid weird reads the warning? <laughs> but I was reading the warning and it said, you must use two forms of birth control. And I, I'd be lucky enough to use one at that point. But the point <laughs> being is it said, if you were sexually active, you need to be wearing, using two forms of birth control. And should you, you or your partner, depending on the sex, uh, get pregnant while on this drug, you must abort. I mean, oh it said that on the package, you would think that I would take that. Can you imagine? Seriously, imagine that you're, you know, painting in your house and you read the candidate says, if you accidentally ingest this stuff, or if you get pregnant while painting your house, you wouldn't have that paint in your house. Yeah. Let alone take a pill every single day. Amazing. You know what's crazy? It worked. My acne went away, so I was okay with it, right? I mean, that's what right. I had to do. But yeah. what was really fascinating was it causes a tremendous amount of acidity in your body. and so. You're not allowed to have dairy products while you're on the pill. When the pills were done at the end of a month, I had been off dairy products for a month and my face had cleared up. And then now the pills were done. I was allowed to have dairy products again. As soon as I started having dairy products, my face broke out again. And it was wow. years later when I finally gave up dairy products for, for the purpose of giving up dairy products, I had the same results. So in other words, it was never about the pill. It was about the not being on dairy products for me. Yep, that's and obviously amazing. sugar and wheat had its issues for me. And you know, all the processed caffeine was a big one for me. I actually quit caffeine at 18. I, it, was, it was ruining my life. I know people laugh at me. It's like, you, you talk about it like it was heroin. Yes, that's how I talk about it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of people, it'd be good if a lot more people were hip to caffeine and the effects in their life. You know, they always, they always point to that one study that says it's good for you or whatever. They're like, see, <laughs> I can have you know, my coffee. Trisha, I had uh, Dr. Michael Bruce on my show yesterday. I know I, Michael, he's a great dude, guy. I, I met him many years ago in Denmark, weirdly, and then we reconnected recently through, um, through my publisher, Mind Valley. And I had him on the show yesterday and he gave this list and he goes, and don't have any caffeine at least, you know, four hours, I think, before you go to bed. And I said, Michael, I'm going to put you on the spot because you say, it's six hours, he said. He said, because, you know, caffeine is a half-life of six hours. And I, I'm doing the math on that. Well, but what that means is, is that you have some caffeine. Six hours later, you have a half as much caffeine. It doesn't mean it's all gone. Right. It means 12 hours later, you have a quarter as much caffeine. And it means another six hours, 18 hours later, you still have an eighth of the caffeine. So in other words, it takes a good 36 to 40 hours to flush the caffeine out. So I said, listen, are you saying to give it six hours because frankly, people can't just handle the truth? Or would you think <laughs> it would be better to give up caffeine entirely? And he goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, caffeine, they should, <laughs> this is like one of the most prominent you know, sleep doctors, he's the guy. But of course, the public's not willing to hear that stuff sometimes. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point. You know, it's like how well do you want to sleep, really? <laughs> you know, and and how and would you really need the caffeine if you got restful sleep? There's that. Let's be honest, right? No. So, um, okay, so let's talk about Wild Fit Fit because it's wildly popular and it's and it's so aligned with the things I believe in terms of good nutrition. So, how did that come about? You know, um, so step one was I had my own recovery. Step mm-hmm. two, as I became curious about why doctors didn't study food, that made me realize I needed to study food. So I started studying food. And um, around about the same time, what was really interesting about this is that growing up, I'd known that my great grandfather had discovered the Florespod skull, which was the oldest homo sapien skull in the history of earth. Wow. And he was a geologist and archeologist. And it was, you know, it was the, or, or, I, now there's been one found a little bit older, but I mean, we're talking about a quarter of a million years. And so even as a child, I was fascinated by our early history. I'd held a cast of the skull in my hand and it has these bite marks in it. And I remember, th- and we don't know if those bite marks are 
cause of death or after death. We don't know. But they're about the size of a hyena or a leopard. And it just, it's so intriguing to me. I, I, I wish that somehow we could take that skull and put it in some kind of special you know, video recorder where we could see the life of that person. You know? But because I've been wor- wondering about that stuff ever since I was little, one day there was this moment. And Trisha, it was just, it's just magic, right? You know, when you've got that, like these days, if you have a question, you just go to Google. But back then, you know, BG, (laughs) you know, the question just bounced around in there until maybe you spotted the pattern. And what happened in my case was I was on a photo assignment for Virgin Atlantic Airways. I was on one of their planes flying to South Africa. And and I was reading an article about elephants because I'm fascinated by conservation and elephants and stuff. And a lot of people don't realize elephants lived all over the world. They lived in Japan. They lived all over the Americas. Like, so I'm fascinated by them. And, and so I'm reading this article and it talks about how they first put elephants in zoos and how they would only live six or seven, 10 years max. But that was okay because they made money back on the investment. And then as soon as they found out that elephants could live 70 years, they started going, holy cow, we could get 10 times as much return on our investment. I'd like to think some of them actually cared about the elephants too, but mostly it was like, <laughs> wow, we could get this thing to live for 70 years. We wouldn't have to buy another one. And wow. so the article then changed my life because the, the writer kept talking about the elephant's captive diet compared to the elephant's wild diet. And, and I thought that's grammatically incorrect. The elephants don't have a wild diet. They have the elephant's diet. And then as I was having that thought, I, I wanted to take out a red pen and circle this and go, yeah, grammatically incorrect. You know, as I saw that, I thought to myself, wait a second, we use the word diet wrong. We're the only animals that do it. Like when, we, when, 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 when you're watching a nature show, they don't go, well, the cheetah is on a diet. They don't, they don't say that. They go, the cheetah's diet is to eat 2.5 kilograms of fresh meat every day. The leaf cutter ant's diet is not to eat leaves. It's to go and collect leaves and compost them and farm aphids. Like, and if you tried to make the leaf cutter ant become a vegetarian and eat leaves, it would die. So it, it, it hit me all of a sudden, wait a second, if every living species on earth has a diet, so, so must we. And that sent me down one really important path and a huge path of frustration. Because when I got there, when I got through the nutritional anthropology and I got really clear, and to me, it's scientifically solved. We know what sapiens have been eating. We know there's not a, I don't care what the food marketing people tell us. We know the answer, but you know, Trisha, what you work on and what I work on every day is people knowing what to do and not doing it. Yeah. And that's where I, um, I sat down with myself one day and I said, I'm, I, I want to know how to fix that. And I developed a system for it. We, we now use it in all of our training programs. We call it behavioral change dynamics. And what I did was applied that to the knowledge of WildFit. I took eight clients six years ago, ran them through the program, and all eight of them completed the program, which is in itself a big deal, a three-month <laughs> program. But they all had radical changes to their psychology with food, every one of them. So we did another eight and then another eight. And then, and then one day, Paul Sheely, quite a famous author. I don't know if you know Paul in America, but... He did it. Then he told his network about it. Suddenly 200 people signed up. And then, and then another guy did that for us in Canada, Colin Sprake. And then, and then Vishen Lakiani from uh, Mind Valley. he did it. And then he published pictures of his before after. And the fact that he'd never stuck with anything for so long ago, he's like, how is he getting me to stay to this program? Like, and all of a sudden it blew up around the world. Now we've got 20,000 clients in a, um, 130 countries. We've twice now been the, um, highest customer rated program on the Mind Valley platform and the Canadian government even gave me a medal for, you know, and it's just, and you know, what's crazy. I've, I've, I've been in so many businesses and they, they took work. Like I had to work. I had to really work at it. And you know, with WildFit, I didn't, all I had to do mm-hmm. is give yeah. and give and give. And then the word of mouth just took off. That's it's beautiful. One of the things I'm most proud of in my life. And it's fed your soul, which my work does as well. Yeah. Um, talk to me about what the actual wild fit diet is. Well, okay. So first thing is, you know, and this may be a little cliche, but it's not a diet. It, it, yeah. it, it, it really truly is, um, the way of life methodology. Mm-hmm. And so one of the keys of wild fit is, is that it's, 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 um, it's fundamentally about freedom. In fact, uh, the founder of Zumba, one of the founders of Zumba did our program and contacted me immediately and he goes, Holy crap, you guys, you guys are about to do to the diet industry. What we did to fitness. How can I help? And I, I started asking him, you know, what he, like why he was saying this. And he goes, well, cause you do this in a way that gives people freedom where most diets are about taking freedom away. And that Zoom is all about that. Like it's, it's, a, it's a matchup. 
And so the first thing is it's about freedom. It's about people being free to eat what they want, when they want, as much as they want, and not feeling guilty about it. And, and so then what we go to do is we go to work on their wants. And by rewiring the wants, that allows them to maintain that sense of freedom. But the other half of the freedom coin that people don't really understand is, and I know you really do, and I know this is something you work with your clients on, it's not just freedom to eat, it's the freedom not to eat. Yeah. And so that's what we work on. Now, from a nutritional perspective, we're very heavily based in um, evolutionary biology and nutritional anthropology. So what we're, you know, you could say that WildFit is maybe in the paleo-ish family, although we mm -hmm. have some differences and not, not, you know, no, not, not ideological differences, just some difference in deployment. A, we work a lot with psychology, which generally isn't the case with diet programs. And B, what I think a lot of the programs uh, that are paleo-based or, or that are origin-based are missing is that humans evolved um, cyclical, um, uh, cyclical body functions designed for seasonal transition. And most programs don't consider that. They don't understand that. So, you know, even with us, like we get people having some green smoothies sometimes and stuff. And then I got to call, I got to like, I got to send them a, an email, stop drinking that. It's not like there's no one thing that's perfect every day. You got to take a break from everything because your yeah. body buffers up on stuff and then it gets low again and it buffers up. And so that's kind of where we are nutritionally. I love that. Um, Gosh, so much there. And I want to backtrack a little bit um, just on the idea of freedom. You know, so many people when they first, uh, when I talk to people who have been struggling chronically with food and weight, you know, they're so afraid you're going to take something away from them. You know, they're yeah. so afraid of that deprivation feeling because they've had it for so long in the diet paradigm, you know, and, and what I have to really talk to them about is imagine not wanting something like it's a whole game changer. If yeah. you don't actually have to have the ooey gooey chewy thing, if you're not compelled, like imagine if that compulsion were removed, then you have freedom of choice, you know, yeah. but they're imagining they're going to have to have it and they're not going to get to have it. And that's, that's exactly like, right. that's hell basically being an emotional eater. Like I know that's a place of hell. Like you can only do that for so long. And that's why everybody's always waiting for the other shoe to drop. If they are doing well, because they know they can, it can only last for so long. Their willpower can only last for so long. So it's exactly, I love when you talk about that because it's really, um, it's really changing for me. It's changing the, the inside and the emotions, you know, addressing and healing the emotions um, and reducing the stress so that you no longer have to have those, and, you know, those anesthetics, essentially, of the sugar and the carbs and other heavy things that just put a blanket over our emotions. So you, yeah. it's so right on the money. I just love that. And, um, one, and way you can, one way you can describe that willpower thing, Trisha, is there's a difference between the mind and the body. And so the mind is where willpower is, is and the body is where survival lives. So if you don't train the body, then you can use willpower in the short term, but the body will take over. And the way to test this is take a deep breath and hold it for as long as you can using your willpower. Eventually, the body will overpower you and make you breathe. So again, same metaphor. When somebody uses willpower to go on a ridiculous calorie restriction, I mean, that's just insane, but yeah. they go on a willpower on a calorie restriction diet, the body will take over. And that's, you know, what yeah. we have to do is actually retrain the body. <laughs> That's so true. I always say your body's going to get pissed off. You know, it's going to say enough of this, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're skipping meals, thinking you're going to hack the system. So yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. Can you talk more about the seasonal transition and how that evolved in your, you know, in, in what you teach people? Yeah. Um, there, there's a, you know, one of the things about studying evolutionary biology is that, you know, one of my rules about food science works like this. If you see a study that makes a claim about food, compare the claim against evolutionary biology. If it violates evolutionary biology, really take a second look at the study because it's probably wrong or it's taking advantage of a seasonal thing that isn't a full-time deal. So for example, um, you know, when Atkins got very popular, which was kind of the original keto program, uh, I'm a big fan of keto, but keto is a season, it's not a lifestyle. And so what happened for a lot of people is they went on to Atkins and, and, and they were stimulating keto, but they were doing it with heavy, heavy, wrong kind of fats, lots yeah. of dairy products, all that kind of stuff, but they stimulated the weight loss. Mm -hmm. But then, then afterward, they started stuffing other kind of health issues. And, and I, I'll tell you, I mean, you know, when he slipped and fell and died and they didn't do an autopsy, it was the smartest thing in the world for them not to do because <laughs> he, he, there was clearly other issues involved there. And, and of course, that would have been bad for the diet 
brand if that came out. Right. So when we talk about seasons, what we realize is that, um, it, like maybe the easiest way is this, is that chipmunks and squirrels, they just know winter's coming. They know that it's coming. And I don't know if they have an app for that or I don't know how they, <laughs> like, <they're, laughs> oh, oh, winter's coming. And, and so, yeah. but they start planning and they start storing calories two ways. They, they store nuts physically, but they also fatten up and, and, and their fur starts getting thicker. They're making a change for the season. So we do the exact same thing. When, when our body knows that winter's coming now, but the thing we have to remember is we're not from Minnesota. We're not from New York. We're not from you know, Estonia. We're not, we are from Sub-Saharan Africa. And so those are the seasons we evolved for, in my opinion. And uh -huh. so what that means is that when our body knows winter is coming, what our body goes, our body doesn't go, oh, we have to like uh, grow a thick set of fur because it's Minnesota. No, uh, wind, uh, winter there means drought. So what do we need to do? We need to store calories in water. We got to start storing calories in water. So, but wait a minute, how do we know winter is coming? Well, we know winter is coming because suddenly the carb rich foods become available. The, the root vegetables become plentiful and the berries are on the trees and the fruit starts to ripen because it's reaping season. And during reaping season, you're supposed to eat those foods and you're supposed to trigger fat gain in order to make sure you survive the coming winter. And, and so then of course, as you switch seasons to the other side, you go to spring, well, what happens in spring? Well, here's something very cool is if you look at the impalas, for example, they have a breeding season that might last say four, five, six weeks, but they all have their babies on pretty much the same day. How do they do that? Well, why they do it is interesting. It's because if they had their babies on normal gestation, then the lions would eat them all and the, lion, and the leopards and the hyenas. But if they have all the babies on the same day, the lions can only eat so much. And then that gives the babies a day or two to get their strength to be able to run. So it's an evolutionary protection. But in the meantime, what it means is come the rains, that's how they know. The minute the rains come, they start dropping their babies. And our ancestors, this would have been ultimate hunting time. There's a plentitude of greens growing everywhere, fresh green plants, not root vegetables so much, but fresh green plants, and a huge amount of meat available, eggs and, and fish and meat and so on. And so we would have headed into what we now call keto, what really is just spring. And as we go into wild fit spring, then our body goes, oh, a winter's over. And now, like you and I would do, if you and I were on a long hike and we had lots of extra snacks in our backpack and we'd be afraid to eat them and let them go if we didn't know when the hike was going to be over. So we'd hold on and it'd be hard to, and then all of a sudden we go, oh, look, there's a plentitude. We can put the backpack down now and the body will, de will deregulate fat and, and, we'll, and we're supposed to, we're supposed to add five pounds and then we're supposed to drop off the five pounds and it's a normal seasonal rotation. How interesting. So is that just recommend, like, is, so how does that translate in how, what your recommendations are for people? Well, it's a matter of, um, you know, obviously most of us don't live in sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, we don't have to live directly according to those seasons. And I'm not, what we say is learn the biology that goes into those seasons and then use them to your advantage. So sadly, if we look around the world today, what we have is a population of people that are overfed energy and underfed nutrients. So they're literally overfed and starving at the same time. And I would put to you that COVID-19 is not a superbug. It's not some unbelievably dangerous virus. It is a wimpy ass virus that is only dangerous in a population that has really significant health problems because of a disastrous food manufacturing, food lobbying, food marketing, and governmental regulation system. So that's why it's dangerous. And when we're healthy, it wouldn't be such a problem to us. But the trouble is obesity numbers are off the charts where nobody under 40 had type two diabetes in the seventies in America. And now there are 20 million people under 40 with diabetes. Like it's a, it's an explosion, a yeah. health epidemic that is like, here's, here's what's crazy. Diabetes is costing the American people $300 billion a year. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's mind blowing. And so where, where, where we can now fix some of those things is realize that one of the reasons that somebody might develop obesity or type two diabetes, or as Dr. Mark Hyman calls it, diabetes, mm -hmm. then what we might take a look at is they've been just living in the wrong season for a long time. They don't have a disease, they have an injury. They, type two diabetes, we don't regard, I have a, I, where I'm actually working on a book right now with Dr. Ruben Ruiz and, and Mark Hyman wrote the foreword for us and it's called post-diabetic because it's not an, we don't regard it as a disease, we regard it as an injury and so how do you fix it? Well, get out of the season that was causing the injury and yeah. move to the season that counterbalances you. So in that case, 
somebody needs to go into a season without so much of the carbs and they're going to go into a, a wild fit spring or a keto and their body's going to recover. That doesn't mean they can never have carbs again. It just means they need to be careful because their sensitivity is messed up. Yeah. And I love that. Um, and, and absolutely, you know, it's, it's amazing how healable diabetes is, you know, when we do start changing the way we eat and the way we live. Um, yeah. Can you, can, I want to have a carb discussion, you know, and help people understand. I mean, you know, my, my approach on the carb thing as a food addict, you know, somebody who went way down the rabbit hole of overeating, you know, to me, carbs, the biggest problem with carbs in my body is the addictive the addictive part of it, you know, yeah. when it, that, you know, it, it, it um, metabolizes a sugar and I'm a sugar addict and car, you know, when I eat carbs, I just want more carbs, you know, when I eat sugar, I just want more sugar. So it, I, I sort of bring it down to that level. That just makes you saner around food. If you're limiting the carbs and the amount of sugar that your body's taking in, but obviously there's problems with carbs beyond that, you know, um, in your body. So can you talk to that a little bit? Well, I think, you know, um, I, I'm probably not going to tell you anything you don't already know, but let's, let's go over this. First of all, English is a funny language where we use one word for an entire group of things. So <laughs> yeah. like, for example, is meat good or bad? Yes, meat can be good or bad. And yep. same with carbs. Are there good carbs and bad carbs? Of course there are. So obviously the first thing is, is really to work on eliminating anything that's a questionable carb. In my opinion, one way to figure that out is if nature didn't produce it, it's a questionable carb. That, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I don't mean at all because, of course, wheat was produced by nature, but bread was not. And by the way, if you want to eat wheat, feel free. Just go eat the wheat. Don't eat the bread. By the way, you can't <laughs> because your teeth would never let you eat the wheat because you, you, we were never evolved for that. So when I say that it, if it was produced by nature, it's more likely to be a, a healthy carb. Now, that's not a, a pure rule, of course, but the other way to look at it is, is that obviously the, what I'm really trying to say is the processed carbs are clearly the problem. Refined sugar, cooked syrups, uh, you know, uh, processed grains and breads and pastas and all those kinds of things. And they are infinite. They're, 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 they're so addictive. They're more addictive even than the natural sugars. Like, and by the way, Trisha, here's what's funny about addiction. In my opinion, there's physical and emotional addiction. And where they get really difficult is when they get combined. Um, it's kind of like phobias. If you have a phobia of balloons, it's because somebody popped a balloon in your face when you were three, and we can undo that phobia fairly easily. But if you have a phobia of spiders, it's a phobia on top of a genetic fear because spiders can be dangerous, right? So mm -hmm. food is a little bit like that. It's one of the most difficult addictions. It's like, it's like sex addiction. You're like, well, alcohol, just stop having it. Yeah. You're gonna take, join a 12-step program and stop having it. Yeah. Try that with sex and food. I'm not doing that. You know, so- yeah. So now we have to look at where carbs are playing a role. And one thing that's really helpful is to understand why they do this. And I'm sure you, you've seen this, but if you and I were walking along 100,000 years ago in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it was you know, coming spring into the summer, heading toward the late summer, and oh my God, look, there's berries on the tree. We'd go over and we'd eat some of those berries. And our stomach is only normally the size of our fist. That's the normal size of it. So any meal doesn't need to be any bigger than that, right? But you and I would go eat five, six, seven, eight pieces of fruit, which is enough to fill our stomach. And we'd start to walk away. But you know, as well as I do, one of us is going to break. One of us is going to go, Trish, <laughs> I'm going to head back over to that tree. Let's go get some more of that fruit. And we're going to go back. And why we're going to do that is that we got a sugar rush. We started making insulin. And then we ended up with insulin shock, which created a sugar craving. And the reason for this is if we didn't have that, we wouldn't fatten up enough to survive the winter. So it's sometimes nice to know what the mechanism underneath it is. And here's one hack that we give people about this with carbs is we have them work on designing their carb window. In other words, how long is the carb window going to be? You see, nature used to just take them away. Oh, carbs are gone. <laughs> Welcome to winter, right? Like yeah. over. And then I'm sure there was depression and sadness and people fought with each other. But at the end of the day, they, who could they be mad at? Mother nature. The problem we have now is that nobody ever takes it away from us. So what we do is create these ratios. So, you know, kind of works like this. Like somebody's like, oh, I'm going to go and I want to go eat that carb. Good carb, bad carb, whatever. Great. So how many days in, are you going to do that for? Make a firm decision about it. Mark it in the calendar and know that you're going to go back into spring or you're going to, or, or you're going to, you know, or you're going to go into winter. You're going to change seasons and end the carb thing. And you know that the first two or three days of it are going to be yucky. You'll have to use willpower for two, three days, but then the cravings will fade again. 
that's how we tend to approach the food addiction kind of carb addiction thing. Yeah, except for those who can't just do that. <laughs> You're right. It's a muscle. It, it's a muscle. It's not, you know, yeah. there, are, there are specific things we do to try to help people get there. It, 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 it is difficult. But yeah. the one thing that's really good to know about this is, weirdly, it's easier to do from fruit addiction than it is from refined sugar addiction. And so one of the things that we do with clients is we have them use fruit almost like methadone. So we ask them to switch to healthy carbs as the transition. Yeah. And then to work on breaking the carb addiction. Cause it's yeah. like trying to give up heroin first. No, no, no. Let's no, go to you, methadone. Then we yeah. can stop the methadone. No question about it. It's so yeah. hard to go cold Turkey because it's not only physical. I mean, you got the physical side of it, but you do have the emotional side of it. And it's like, yeah. you know, you sort of have to learn to metabolize your emotions, the emotions that come up when you no longer have that, that, you know, blanket that covers the emotions. So yeah, so I, I love other, that. Trish, I think the other thing is leverage, right? Like, let's get clear. You know this. Carbs age you faster. They just do. Burning sugar ages you faster. Burning sugar raises cortisol, makes it hard to lose weight, triggers insulin, makes it hard to lose weight. Uh, um, it, it, it's, it's like it, it, it um, messes with, it creates the addiction. Yeah. Um, it causes mood swings. It causes, uh, you know, low, low blood sugar, anger, and, and frustration. I mean, on every level, except for the 30 seconds you're eating it, it deteriorates your quality of life. That's why I tell people there's like no redeeming qualities of sugar, like zero redeeming qualities of sugar. Exactly. Except the, the few seconds that you're eating it yeah. and it's all downhill from there. Well, this is such a great conversation, Eric, and I so appreciate you bringing this information. How can people learn more about you and WildFit? Sure. Well, I, the best way to get a hold of me really is Instagram. I actually manage my own Instagram. I talk to people all the time and answer questions. And it's Beautiful. just my name at Eric Edmeads. And of course, anybody curious about WildFit can go to getwildfit.com. And there's all kinds of information there and snack packs. And we have a 14 day challenge and that kind of stuff. So they can definitely find that stuff out. Instagram, me and uh, website getwildfit.com. Great. And we'll put that in the show notes as well. So thank you so much. It's always so good to talk to you. You're filled with such in interesting information and perspectives. Um, so thanks a lot for being here on this show. I uh, often ask, sometimes I forget, but I often, uh, when I remember it, will ask my uh, guests one last parting question. And so you're, you're going to get it today. Go for and it. that is, what is your deepest hunger? This being the Heal Your Hunger show, of course. You know, I've been isolated for like five weeks now. I don't know if I can answer that right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, really, my deepest, one of my, one of, one of my really, truly deepest spiritual hungers is um, uh, um, to help people move out of discomfort and pain. I, I, I have a weirdly overactive empathy. And, and so when I see people that are suffering or sick or stressed or what have you, I just, I just want to help. And so that is one of the things that just drives me every single day. Beautiful. And you are, I mean, you're working at breakneck speed to do that. So uh, thank you so much. Even, even while during uh, cooped up at home, being cooped, cooped up at home. So great to talk to you. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for tuning in and you can watch this uh, actually and comment in the secret sauce to end emotional eating Facebook group. And please join me for the next episode coming up soon. So thanks again, Eric. Hey, thanks for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to get free support, insider health info, exclusive invites to events, and more, visit HealYourHunger.com.